about the world that we're living in today, there are a lot of different religious movements that we see uh, around about us, and, and some of them don't seem to impact God's people very much, and some of them seem to impact God's people a lot, and I suppose that the religious movement that I'm going to talk about tonight is somewhere in the middle of that. Um, I'd like to talk with you about this red-letter Christian movement. Maybe a few of you have heard of that. Maybe nobody's heard of that. I don't know. But I think a few of you have. Maybe quite, quite a few of you have. I don't know. But um, red-letter Christians, as they call themselves, constitute what they see as a non-denominational movement among evangelicals. Um, proponents of the movement believe that Christianity uh, and especially evangelical Christianity has been exploited by right-wing and left-wing political movements and has become too politicized and partisan and so what their thing is if you will is that they want to take evangelical what they call evangelical Christianity in America and again I'm using all those terms sort of accommodatively but they want to take that into um, a, a movement that focuses almost exclusively on the teachings that Jesus Christ uttered while he was walking the earth and so those red letters that you have in some editions of the Bible they want to they want to focus on those red letters and not so much on uh, the rest of the New Testament or much of anything else as far as that is concerned. The, the two most prominent uh, figures associated with this movement are uh, two, uh, one's a Baptist preacher named Tony Campalo and the other is an evangelical named Jim Wallace and uh, they along with some other uh, evangelical leaders have sort of spearheaded this movement the last few years. Obviously, as I mentioned, <clears throat> the idea of the red letters refers to the New Testament verses that are printed in red letters in many editions of the Bible, what we call red letter editions of the Bible. My Bible is a red letter edition. Probably many of you have uh, one of those as well. And the idea of that is that these are quotations of Jesus from Jesus as he walked the earth. You might be interested to know that the first red letter edition of the scriptures was only printed in 1899. So if we're just supposed to be following the red letters, that's only been known for a very short period of time. Uh, so we haven't had this, these red letter editions around for all that long. Many Christians throughout the history of the church, many religious people, a lot of the denominational folks, have tried to sort of focus on the teachings that Jesus gave while he walked the earth. And so that concept is not necessarily all that new, but the particular movement that we're seeing right now is, is somewhat of a backlash against, again, as I mentioned, the way these particular guys think that quote unquote Christianity in America, the way it's been going has not been to suit them. And they point to two particular uh, issues that have come up where they feel like uh, people who call themselves Christians in America have been too harsh, have politicized things too much, have uh, focused on things that don't need to be focused on and left off some things that we should be focusing on. And the two issues that they're concerned about are abortion and homosexuality. Please understand what I'm saying. What they are saying is that Christians in America have focused on those things too much and have in some way perverted the gospel to political ends by focusing on you know the issues of abortion and homosexuality and they want to bring Christianity in their minds back to let's just look at the teaching of Jesus you know the Sermon on the Mount the things he said in the red letters talking about you know mercy and grace and and how all of that reflects on bigger social issues that they feel are being neglected such things as um, social justice and poverty and those kinds of things which they feel have been neglected by what they perceive to be Christians in America. I think that that thinking has permeated the church and that's why I'm talking about this tonight. 
I, I think that there are members of the Lord's church that, and I'm hearing this a lot more, seeing it on social media a good bit, are, are talking about, well, if you're, if you're not, you know, in the, if, you if you're not into fighting for social justice, if you're not into, uh, you know, fixing poverty in our country, you're not a real Christian. In fact, I saw a post just this last week on social media to that effect. And I just think that's misguided. I think this movement's misguided in a number of ways, and I do think it's influencing us in ways that uh, it ought not. Now, is that to say that uh, these guys are entirely wrong, that people haven't sort of perverted Christianity to political ends to get people elected? Uh, maybe folks didn't really care much about the abortion issue or the homosexuality issue, but they were using these as sort of political ploys to, to, to gain vo votes in certain areas of the country. I expect that's probably true. I expect that there's, there's, a, there's a truth to that that we should be concerned about as well. But I'd like to just tonight with you, if you'll follow this for just a few minutes, I don't think this will take all that long, uh, just to talk about uh, this idea of red letter Christians. Is that what we want to be or do we just want to be real Christians? And, and the premise, of course, is that if you're going to be a follower of Christ, are you just going to follow the things he said while he walked the earth or are you going to follow everything else that's in the New Testament? Did Jesus not follow the black letters as well? And if we follow him, aren't we going to be interested in what the black letters have to say ever bit as much as what the red letters have to say? And I hope to show you in the course of time over the next few minutes that in fact, the black letters of the New Testament carry just as much weight as the red letters of the New Testament. And we need to see all of them. If we're gonna say red letters are important, then they're all red letters because they're all the words of Christ. So that's sort of an overview of where we're going. We need to believe what Jesus said in those red letters. And what he said in those red letters says a lot about social justice and righteousness and quite a bit about authority that the black letters also say. To begin with, as you look at the focus of those red letters, if you look at what Jesus said in those red letters as he walked the earth, was he more concerned about social justice, these issues that these guys are raising, or was he more concerned about personal righteousness? I believe it's evident if you really just look at what he said, that Jesus was very little concerned about social justice. He wasn't trying to fix society. He was trying to fix people. And, and for people on the political right or left to sort of co-opt the New Testament and the words of Jesus for their political means is sort of misses the point of who Jesus was and what he was standing for. Let me give you uh, some things to think about. The red letters teach that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world repeatedly teach that. Jesus told Pilate when he stood before him, here's a political leader. Here's the governor of Judea. And he stands before this man and, he want, and Pilate wants to know, are you a king? Are you a threat to us politically? Are you concerned about political issues? Really is what he's asking him. Because if Jesus was a political, you, you, you know, uh, person, if he was trying to overtake society in, in some way as to govern through civil authority, Pilate would have had a problem with that. You might remember that Pilate didn't really have a problem with Christ. In fact, twice he said, I find no fault in him. And so Jesus, in answering the question in John 18 and verse 36, he said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. That doesn't sound like somebody who's trying to fix all the political issues of the world. It sounds like somebody who's trying to transcend them and go beyond and above them. In Luke chapter 17 and verse 20, 
He was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. And he answered and said to them, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there. Indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. It's, it's a, a personal thing. I'm trying to change people on the inside. I'm not trying to rule through political means at all. The red letters teach that issues of social justice and of politics were of far less importance to Jesus and should be of far less importance to us than commitment to God and to his righteousness. You know the story in John chapter 8. Here is an issue of social justice, if you will. In fact, the Jews bring to Jesus a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And so basically they want Jesus to act as a civil judge in this case. And they want him to pronounce what justice would be in this situation. Now, mind you, this was a, this was a big issue among the Jews. What constituted adultery? How should it be dealt with? And, and it was, had a lot of political overtones to it, at least among Jewish people in the first century. But in John chapter 8 and verse 2, they bring this woman to Jesus, verse 3 says, caught in the very act of adultery. And they said to him in verse 4, teacher, this woman was caught in, in, in adultery in the very act, and Moses in his law commanded us that we should, she should be stoned. What do you say? And they were just testing him when they said this. He acted in verse 6 as though he did not hear, but they continued in verse 7 asking him, and he raised himself up and said to them, what? Well, let me make the pronouncement that tells you how to deal with this social justice issue. Let me explain it to you. Is that what he said? No, because that's not what he was trying to solve. He was trying to solve the problem in men's hearts. And so he dresses them this way. He says, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Do the right thing. You want justice, you want judge, you want justice, start with yourself. Judge yourself first. Straighten your own life up first before you start bringing other people to be stoned. And by those few words, Jesus caused every one of these people to be convicted by their own consciences. And he turns to the woman. And said, swear your accusers. And she said, they're not here. And he tells her to go her way and sin no more. Now that, that's just a really strange way of dealing with a, a problem, an issue. If, you're, if your point on earth was to solve all of the issues of social justice. That's just a really weird way to deal with that. I don't think it was his point. In Matthew chapter 22... There's, a, again, a hot potato of a political issue that gets tossed in Jesus' lap. The Pharisees came to Christ in Matthew 22 and verse 17. And they said, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus perceived their wickedness and he said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard these th words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Whether or not Jews should pay taxes to the Romans was again a big political issue among the Jews. You can only imagine, uh, you know, being occupied by a foreign country and they're trying to impose taxes on you and, and you have religious convictions that, you know, well, we should be an independent state here. We're God's chosen people. We shouldn't be subject to anybody. And we certainly shouldn't be paying our taxes to these pagans. And many Jews felt that way. So here's this huge political issue. And Jesus has this opportunity to come out and solve that. Make a stand. Take a stand about it. That's not what he's interested in. He's not interested in solving this political social problem. He's interested in individuals giving to God the things that are God's.
and this issue as they raise it, I don't think it means much to Jesus. What they were concerned about is not what he was concerned about. And I'm here to tell you tonight that as you look at our society today and you see the things that are being raised as the big issues across the board, many of them, Jesus would point to us individually and say, what's in your heart? What are you doing as an individual in your life, in your relationship with God? It's easy to get on social media and run one side down or the other side down and pick some sort of hot button social issue to say all kinds of things about. It's another thing to change your life. And what Jesus focused on is you change your life. Jesus, by the way, as I mentioned, these uh, red letter Christians, quote unquote, you know, they don't, they don't really want to deal a lot with the issues of um, homosexuality, for instance. Uh, they don't want to deal a lot with the issues of abortion. They think that's been far overdone. I want to read you something that Jesus said in the red letters. I preached a sermon on this several months ago, but I'll, I'll just point it out again. Uh, most of you here realize this, but in Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5, Jesus said something about the issue of homosexual marriage. <clears throat> a lot of people sort of ignore this, but um, here's what he said. They're asking him a question about marriage and divorce. And Jesus said, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's in red letters, folks. God made them male and female. That's what the red letters say. What are we going to say? Are we going to ignore that? I don't think the red letter folks really want all the red letters. And we could go on with other things. I think you see the point. The red letters really say that the issues of social justice are not all that concerning to Christ. It's a person's righteousness that he's concerned with, a person's relationship with God. The other major point I want to cover in this lesson has to do with asking ourselves what the red letters say about the black letters of the New Testament. What did Jesus, in the words that he spoke while he was walking the earth, especially words that he spoke to his apostles, what is he indicating about what the black letters would say? And I think it's a very, very interesting study. The red letters, and you're going to maybe gasp when you first read this, but the red letters say that the red letters don't have all the truth. And you say, well, what in the world are you talking about? I want you to look at John 16, and we're going to make a point here. We're going to make another point in a minute on John 16. But Jesus in John 16, he's gathered with his apostles, just the 11 now. Judas has already gone out, just the 11 are there, and he's trying to prepare them for the fact that he's going to go away to the Father. He mentions this numerous times, starting in John 14, 15, 16, uh, all the, these three chapters, over and over again. He says, I'm going away to the Father, you know, I'm not going to be here anymore. Uh, and, and in John 16 and verse 12, he, he says something, I think, that ought to really get our attention when it comes to this issue that we're looking at. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Now, folks, Jesus is telling his apostles, I haven't said everything to you that you need to hear. You can't take it yet. 
But when the spirit of truth, I'm going away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And when he comes, he's going to guide you into what? All truth. That means that the red letters don't have all truth. All truth's not in the red letters. There was more truth to be revealed to the apostles through the Holy Spirit. So if you just say, we're just going to go by the red letters, what you're saying is, I'm going to go by just part truth. Because Jesus hadn't shown his apostles all the truth yet. They couldn't take it yet. They weren't ready for it yet. I don't know about you, but I don't want to base my life on just part of the truth. I'd like to base it on the whole truth. Later on in John 20, verses 21 and 22, Jesus said to them again, <clears throat> Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. The word send here is an interesting word. It's a verb, uh, apostello. We get our word apostle from that. And basically he says, my father apostled me and I'm apostling you. I'm sending you out with this special message. And he breathes on them symbolic of receiving the Holy Spirit. And he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Of course, in another context, he tells them to wait in Jerusalem till they be endued with power from on high. And in fact, when we turn over to Acts chapter 2, they were waiting in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, a lot of times we focus on the speaking in tongues in that passage. And that is an important aspect of what went on. But I want you to notice exactly what it says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They all being the 12 apostles now. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Whose words are they speaking? Words that the Holy Spirit is giving them. Where's the Holy Spirit getting those words? Same place Jesus got his words from God the Father. Let's go back to John 16. And notice with me that the red letters teach that the apostles would be given words from Jesus. The next two verses in John chapter 16, verses 14 and 15. Jesus had promised them the Holy Spirit. He says, and he will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. What the Holy Spirit is giving the apostles are red letter words. You see that? The apostles are being given the words of Christ. In Acts 2 and verse 4, they were speaking as who? As the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. And you go on and trace this through the, the pages of the New Testament. You see over and over and over again, the apostles, are, they're not speaking as men. Their letters aren't black letters. They're red letters. They're speaking the words of Christ all the way through and everything they say and write through inspiration. So we come to... 1 Corinthians chapter 2, for instance, in verse 7. And Paul talks about this process of, of inspiration, of the words of the Spirit. He says about himself and the apostles, he says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of his glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. As it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of men the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us, that is the apostles, God has revealed those things to us through his spirit. This same spirit that Jesus promised them, this same spirit that gave them utterance in Acts 2, now is revealing to them God's will. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. What man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of man that is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. The things the apostles spoke, where did they get them from? The claim in 1 Corinthians 2 is, these are words that come from the Spirit. The Spirit 
gets them from Jesus. John 16. Jesus gets them from the Father. The apostles are speaking red letter words. Paul says essentially the same thing in Ephesians chapter 3 about where he's getting these words from, the words that he's writing in these epistles. He talks about how that by revelation, God made known to him the mystery, the mystery of the gospel, as he's written already, he says. Verse 4 of Ephesians 3, By which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Sounds like the words of the holy apostles and prophets are red letter words. Are red letter words. In fact, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It's all given from the mouth of God. What we come to understand then is that the rest of the New Testament, the black letters in the Gospels, the black letters in Acts, the black letters in the Epistles and in Revelation, they're all really red letters. The Epistles are Jesus' words. There can be no doubt about it. In Second Peter chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, the Apostle Peter classes the writings of the Apostle Paul with other scripture, he calls them. So Paul's writings are scripture. There's other things that are also scripture. These are things that are given by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Red letter Christians, so-called, sometimes give Paul a hard time. In fact, he seems to be their, New Test their least favorite New Testament writer. I heard about a preacher who said that as a young man, he loved Paul's letters, even memorized most of, most of the epistle of, to the Romans. But then he said this about something he discovered later in life. He says, my focus on Romans and Ephesians was obscuring my vision of Jesus. So I start with Jesus now. Everybody focus with me for a minute. <laughs> I want you to think about what this man's saying. He's studying Romans. He's memorizing Romans. He's studying Ephesians. And he comes to the conclusion, a very false conclusion, that somehow what he's reading in Romans and what he's reading in Ephesians is actually obscuring his view of Jesus. Because what he's saying is, I should get my view of Jesus from the Gospels in those red letters in the Gospels. And that all of this, you know, spiritual instruction and theology that you see in Romans and Ephesians and Hebrews, that's, that's just, you know, clouding the issue of who Jesus is. No, it isn't. It's explaining who Jesus is. It's all the truth that Jesus couldn't give to his apostles while he walked with them. You don't know Jesus until you know what's in the epistles. It's the fuller explanation of who he is and what he's done for us and what he expects of us and how to have a relationship with him. I wonder what Paul would have had to say if he'd heard that preacher. Paul obscuring Jesus? Really? Can, can you even imagine? Here's the Apostle Paul who'd given his life, dedicated himself to explaining Jesus to people, to showing the Christ to the world. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 25, he says about the gospel, he says, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages, from generations, now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, 
which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What's Paul saying? He's saying my whole work, <laughs> my whole work is revealing Christ, Christ in you. That's what all this is about. And if you're reading Romans or Ephesians or Colossians or whatever, and, and you're not getting Christ out of it, you're not reading it right. To the Galatians, he writes in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9, My little children, for whom I labor in birth pains until Christ is formed in you. Who's, what's he trying to get across? Christ. He wants Christ to be formed in people. That's why these epistles are written. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Red letters. The things that Paul was writing are red letters. If focusing on the epistles, on Paul's letters, obscures Jesus, where does the problem really lie? You know, did Paul fail in his mission? I hardly think so. Did Jesus fail by selecting Paul to be his, his apostle to the Gentiles, to take the message of him to the, to the Gentiles? I, I don't think Jesus made a wrong choice. If we think that the epistles obscure who Jesus is, I think the problem's with our thinking. If it's only the words of Jesus that should be written in red, folks, and if those words should have priority over any other words that have been spoken and written in the New Testament, then I say that every word of the New Testament should be as red as the blood that flowed from Emmanuel's veins. What are we going to be judged by? Come Judgment Day, what's the standard? that we're going to have to answer to. Is it red letters? Red letters of the New Testament? Black letters of the New Testament? Or is it all the letters of the New Testament? Jesus said in John 12 and verse 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So you look at that and you say, aha, it's the red letters that are going to judge us at the last day. But wait, then Paul writes in Romans chapter 2 and verse 16, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, according to what he was preaching. Well, wait a minute, Paul, it's the black letters, right? Well, which is it? It's all the letters. And we don't get to pick and choose. This isn't, as I was talking on the radio this morning, <laughs> it's not going to Starbucks and, and picking a flavor of your latte, you know. It's, it's, not, it's not going to a smorgasbord or a buffet and you get to choose who you want Jesus to be or what he wants you to emphasize. That's not what it is. It's taking the New Testament, all the New Testament, rightly dividing the word of truth and applying it to ourselves. In the New Testament, Jesus is so clearly depicted to us. He, he lived a beautiful life that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell us about. He said so many wonderful things when he walked the earth, so many helpful things, and all of them true. But if you just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you really don't understand what Jesus has done for you. You really don't understand how to have a relationship with him, how to live among his people in this world. And you really don't even understand how to respond to it. You know, the book of Acts really tells us about the message being spread and what people did to respond to what Jesus did. And the epistles really tell us how they applied that to their lives and in, their church, in the churches that they were part of. You've got to take it all. And if there's somebody here tonight who's willing to take all of Jesus and say, Here's, I know what he did, I know what he said. He died for me. He rose and ascended back to the Father. 
He's my king and I want to be a part of his kingdom and follow what was written in the rest of the New Testament. If somebody who's ready to make that commitment, we'd ask you to come while we stand and sing.